Buy Manufacturers Direct is proud to bring you this month's installment of Prep Master Media. This month, our host Josh Jones is in Michigan visiting with BMD partner Inland Diamond Products. Located in Madison Heights, Michigan, Inland Diamond Products was launched in the year of America's Bicentennial, 1976. Over their 40 plus years, Inland has carved an industry niche for their unique products and services. Today, Inland successfully operates in the glass, optical, stone, automotive, concrete, and dental industries. With over 40 employees in the United States alone, Inland enjoys global distribution operating from four state-of-the-art manufacturing facilities. Being the largest American-owned glass and diamond wheel manufacturer, Inland is proud to have earned the coveted ISO 9001 certification. Inland's core values embrace a customer-first mentality while supporting their belief in an old-fashioned work ethic. Believing ordinary people can achieve extraordinary things, Inland employees take great pride in engineering, building, and supporting quality-driven products. With a motto of continuous improvement and never satisfied with yesterday's successes, Inland Diamond Products is a committed leader to the surface preparation industry. Today we're in Madison Heights, Michigan, at the corporate headquarters, design laboratories, and manufacturing center of BMD supplying partner, Inland Diamond Products. This company has been in business for 40 years, providing diamond solutions and abrasive products. To put that in perspective, when they opened their doors, Jimmy Carter had just been elected U.S. President, and a new tech company had just been formed with an odd-sounding name, Apple. I'm excited to learn more about what these guys do inside to be a proud U.S. manufacturer. Let's go inside and meet a couple of the key players. I'm joined by Inland Divisional Vice President, Kevin Emery. We're here today to talk more about Inland Diamond Products and also to give our viewers a brief overview of your company. Okay. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you give us a, a snapshot of what and who Inland is? Well, Inland Diamond was formed uh, in 1976 by Ron and Richard Wyand. Um, their main products were optical products. And since that time, we've grown from uh, optical products to solar glass products, automotive wheel production products, uh, concrete, stone polishing, solar glass. Um, we've really broadened uh, our product lines. Inland Diamond Products recognizes the critical role the diamond plays in the surface preparation process. With over 150 patents worldwide, combined with their 43 years of experience, Inland Diamond Products is honored to be considered the patriarch of the engineer diamond and manufacturing industry. A lot of people think diamond manufacturers are basically brokers. Um, they really don't make the product. Um, the time that you guys have been in business, over 40 years, would you say you're more pioneers than followers when it comes to the products that you make? Absolutely. Um, you know, if you look at some of our patents uh, that we do hold, and there are over 150, it's not only on the product itself, but it's of the manufacturing of the product. So we've looked at different ways, you know, even to manufacture uh, at a lower cost. We're always trying to pioneer new things. Um, every Everything we touch here is personal to us. Uh, over the past two years, we've invested over a million dollars in new products, uh, new machinery uh, to manufacture the products here. And we found that by sourcing products here, we're getting a better product, even though it's the same recipe. Most of that can be attributed to the organics of the products here in the States, as opposed to what we're sourcing in Asia. Unlike many of their competitors, Inland only sources their raw materials from ISO certified American-made companies. Sourcing from ISO certified partners not only ensures Inland receives pure and high quality ingredients for their diamonds, but also provides Inland the ability to support fellow American-made manufacturers. Keeping jobs, opportunities, and profits in the United States is the cornerstone of Inland's mission statement. That's the important thing to me is, you know, I can't stress enough how important it is for us to make product in the U.S. Um, it's something that, you know, we've looked at a hundred different times. We can manufacture competitively in the United States. Uh, we can do a better job. Uh, we are the people that came up with the recipes that we've given to Asia. And we feel that we're getting a higher quality product through higher quality materials uh, we QC everything we touch here, and we can still deliver an economical product. 
And when you're actually manufacturing something and you take pride in it, you get a better product. And we have people here that are proud to manufacture here in the U.S. Employing over 40 highly skilled, trained, and motivated individuals at their Madison Heights facility, Inland boasts one of the highest employee retention rates in our industry, with almost half of their team members being employed for over 20 years. Inland self-imposed standards of quality implement specific steps to ensure their customers consistently receive high-quality diamonds every time. They recognize failures in the field cost money. That's why Inland understands the value of their products from the customer's perspective. Adopting a never-fail mentality, the Inland team takes personal pride in the quality of their products, as well as the service and support provided to their customers. Every product that comes through our plant is documented. Every product has a work order, so we can have traceability for everything that we manufacture. And in the event there is an issue, we can go back and find where that issue might be, whether it be a, a supply issue, uh, a diamond issue, or a manufacturer issue, it'll all be there in the work order for us. Most of the stuff is caught in quality control. It goes to our QC department once we receive it, uh, prior to going into the mix room, prior to going into the plant. Uh, it's QC to make sure that it meets our standard. Once the product is manufactured, it goes back to the QC. So it's actually handled twice. Um, and we found that that prevents a lot of our issues, but we do stand behind all of our products 100%. Well, and I think also, we had talked earlier about it, how fast you guys can provide a, a solution to a customer request. That's true. Um, it used to be our reaction time, if we had to redevelop a bond, would be six to eight weeks. What's nice about having all the tools here now is that we can overnight create a new product. If we decide we need to change the mesh of a product, it's something that can be done in hours rather than weeks. Um, we can have an idea this afternoon and we could put that product on the floor tomorrow. One of Inland's competitive advantages is their ability to react to industry needs by leading new technology and industry advancements. As you can see, while inventory turns quickly, Inland keeps plenty of fresh inventory on hand ready to ship. If you're like most people, we sometimes wait until the last minute to order our diamonds. For these guys, that's not a problem. Most diamonds are in stock and ready to ship. You know, we added 7,000 square feet uh, onto our facility just to handle inventory. Um, so I think we're in a pretty good position to fulfill our customers' needs. Well, I think, I think what I take away from this, uh, from spending time listening to you talk about the company that you work for, it seems like, I think you speak for your people as well, that there's a lot of pride that goes into the products that you make. Absolutely. Um, your vision of the American made, the history, um, knowing the products from the time they're, literally from the time they're born, before they're born, and you turn out a product that you feel comfortable standing behind and everybody else here feels the same way. Absolutely. Uh, we, you know, we love what we do and I'm, I got the greatest supporting cast down there I could ask for. Well, I appreciate very much the time. I've definitely learned a lot listening to you talk about the company. Um, I also, uh, again, I can't help but sense the amount of pride that you take in your work. So thank you very much for your thank time. Thank you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. To Inland, customer service isn't an obligation, but rather a responsibility. A responsibility to support those customers trusting in their products. Now I'm joined with Kevin Emery Jr., who is the Industrial Sales Representative for Inland Diamond Products. Kevin, we really appreciate the time you've taken to sit down with us, tell us more about your role in the company. Um, your dad was talking about the customer service aspect that everybody here takes so seriously, the okay. pride that you guys take in your work. Can you run us through a, one of your days or the way that you um, interact with the industry to make sure that it's, let's say, getting all that it's requesting? Generally, um, I'll get phone calls, text, emails from distributors like yourself. If you have any issues, any, any inquiries, I'll take those calls just with some basic information, either pictures or uh, uh, just some general idea of how the tool is being used when the failure happened. Uh, we can generally get a pretty good idea when what uh, caused the failure. I'd like to know what machine's running, you know, what RPM, the weight. Uh, there's a bunch of different variables that I can go through to ask to find out uh, what if it's running wet or dry is another another point. You feel, it sounds like, fairly confident that you could also assess if the machine is correct for the tool they're running. I can, looking at the diamond, looking at uh, the wear patterns, looking at how the tool looks, uh, I can generally get an idea of what's wrong with the way the machine is running, yes. Okay. 
appreciating that the surface preparation industry hosts dozens of grinder manufacturers, all with their unique mechanics, weights, and mounting specifications. Inland has custom designed and manufactured diamonds for all the most popular grinders. Their diamond expertise transcends grinder brand and concentrates on how the diamond itself interacts with the surface. So if you're not getting the most out of your grinder, it might be time to consider a different diamond. And so when it comes to your ability to communicate with a customer or at least understand some of the stuff that's not stated, beside being um, the manufacturer of the product, yeah. you can also speak a little bit of the contractor's language so that they're actually using the correct tool for the application. Right, using it correctly, using it on the right machine, absolutely. And so where does your experience in that, uh, in the industry come from? I mean, what was your background before this life? Before this, I was actually in a van uh, driving fabricator to fabricator, selling tools for uh, countertop fabrication. Okay. So for six years, I was on the road. Okay. And I uh, came over here to help out and get some assistance here. and. I've been here for almost eight years now. Eight years? Yeah. Okay. So. Well, I can't thank you enough for the time you've taken. Tell us more about your responsibility in the company. I can tell again, you know, the in the family environment that you guys have created, um, from your father to you, um, you guys obviously take a lot of pride in your work. So I really can't thank you enough for the time you've taken for coming out. Thank you. Pleasure working with you. Yep, same here. Steve Lloyd, he asked, and this is very subjective, but you're welcome to pitch your product. He asked, we always hear our diamonds are better. Maybe you can explain during the process why they are and what they do that's different than the other diamond manufacturers that make them better, longer lasting, etc." cetera. Well, um, making a diamond better is like making a cookie better. They're all based on your specific recipe, whether you're using grandma's recipe or the recipe off the box. As far as life goes, uh, a lot of that involves diamond quality. Um, it's a matter of how the diamond fractures, uh, the strength of the diamond, uh, the impact resistance. So there's a lot of variables in making uh, a specific tool uh, to say that it's better. Um, it can be better polishing, but it may not have the life. Uh, typically when you're trying to get a high polish, you're using a consumable tool. If you're saying it's better because it lasts longer, um, most of that would be diamond related, not, not bond specific. So it is a subjective, subjective question, you know, what makes a tool better than another? But uh, after 40 years and the experience that we have here, I, I think our recipes are pretty good. Okay. Antonio Avalas, what is the best segment and grit for the polishing of a marble which has been placed on a pavement and is the first time it will be polished? So basically a first cut tool. Uh, a first cut tool, depending on what marble it is, uh, I would say you'd probably go into with a with an 8100. Um, you know, marble's really just a dried up riverbed, you know, it, it's basically mud. Um, I would say 8100 is where I would start. Okay. Uh, Chris Toffoli, he asked, or he said, I am interested in this and have always wondered about real or engineered diamonds. What type of metals and different bonds, how segment shape plays a role, Consist consistency in the sags, manufacturing costs, values and grit mixtures, cool. That's a long question. Answer what part you want. <laughs> well, uh, as far as, you know, natural diamonds opposed to synthetic diamond, um, you know, diamond is diamond, both are diamond. Um, natural diamond tends to be a little bit weaker than engineered diamond, synthetic diamond. Are you saying that the quality of the diamond that makes up the individual segment is, is more important than the shape, the mechanical shape of the actual? No, shape does play an important part. It's just, it, it's, it's kind of a preference. For a long time, people have used arrows uh, anything with a with a single trying to narrow that point to move through the surface um, and they can get stuck on that but you can also use a circle that still has that same cutting edge it's allowing the swarf to move away from that piece and still get the same effect um, I'm you know we could probably run it through a, a CAD program and actually look at what each shape is actually doing to that substrate 
but I still think most of it's personal preference. Bob Whitcraft had made a comment about the bond, okay. and I think you, without giving away any trade secrets, um, I think you could maybe at least enlighten us a bit that it's not just the bond or it's just the diamonds. Can you kind of speak to that? Uh, well, you know, the bond is the most important factor in the segment. Uh, a cost of the segment, the bond has more expense than the diamond itself. And the materials in the bond, um, the higher quality tools use more expensive materials. Uh, the lesser quality tools will typically be iron bonds of some sort. Okay. So the bond is important, but it's that's kind of a general statement. Well, we're looking for diamond retention. We're looking for uh, materials that like one another. Uh, something that we can, uh, you know, allow to hold on to that diamond uh, that'll keep the retention as the bond wears, wears away. As it develops that comet tail and it begins to erode, we need that diamond or the bond to be able to hold on to those larger crystals. You know, even when you've got less than 30% of the bond still retaining that, you know, we try to really find materials that cling to that diamond. So, so it's by design, a properly made tool by design is going to let a certain amount of diamond protrude from the bond. Yes, it has to. And by design, let go or break free or right. release that chip. Yeah, depending on if you're using a metal bond or a resin bond diamond, you know, you're going to have a hard diamond, you're going to have a softer diamond. A resin bond diamond, uh, you may not want the impact resistance of a metal diamond. You may want that to fracture uh, faster uh, so you can develop new sharp cutting edges. Um, but, you know, you've had tools, you know, metal bond tools that will glaze over it, and that's because either the diamond was too soft for the bond and it sheared off. So you have to run the tool and allow that bond to erode away to expose new diamonds. Is that what happens? Yes, that's typically what happens. So, you know, as long as you're, you develop a bond that continues to cut, and you can pick up that tool and you can see the comet tails behind them, you know, feel the diamond protrusion on them, you've got a pretty good mix there. So when they glaze over, I mean, from your standpoint at least, knowing because you put them under a, a magnifying glass, whatever, um, when we say they glaze over, it's because the diamond chips have actually fractured off, flush or below the level of the bond? They've either fractured off to the level of the bond or below, or they've rounded over. Right. And the diamond could be too hard, and when those sharp cutting edges are fractured off, now you're trying to cut with a golf ball. You know, there's nothing there to, to bite. There's no, nothing to grind. So is it incorrect? Because I often tell people that if a diamond glazes, um, for lack of a better term, to put down a secondary abrasive, silicon carbide, sand, glass, whatever, mm -hmm. to sharpen the diamond tips, is that not accurate? Are we actually eroding the bond? You're eroding the bond to expose new diamond. Gotcha. So that the old diamond can be rolled out and the new diamond can be exposed. But now if they rolled, if they did have a rolled edge or they rounded over, then the same would be happening. We're still trying to fracture that chip, or is that kind yeah, of when a... you're putting any type of anything on the floor, especially a softer abrasive that will erode that bond. Mm -hmm. All you're doing is just eroding the bond so that round diamond can be rolled out and a new diamond can be exposed. Okay. So when they do it's like round dressing over? them, if you ever use a dressing stick, it'd mm -hmm. be the same thing. So if they do round over, is there any way to fix that? So once a diamond chip actually rounds over. If it's truly rounded over. Unless you can find a way to fracture it. Okay. Is there any tricks in the field? Uh, I've heard hitting it with a hammer, but I don't know if that works. Well, that, that, I don't recommend that, but you probably do, might work. I don't know. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, that means all. all right. This is a question from John Jackson, um, sort of related. Ask them to explain the difference between diamonds and sandpaper and the fracturing of the crystal, which I think you a little bit alluded to. Yeah. I mean, Diamonds and, diamond and sandpaper, it, they're, they're similar, but they're different. Um, you know, they most, both may be, if you're talking about a resin bond diamond, they may both be made from a phenolic. Uh, typically, sandpaper is a coated product, so it, it's actually two uh, layers of resin, uh, where a wood, instead of diamond, you know, wood sandpaper might use aluminum oxide to, to shave that wood. Uh, in metal, you'd be using a silicon carbide you could use green silicon carbide, I imagine, and wood paper as well, but they're not using diamond. 
uh, to clear if that's his question. Uh, but they're similar except that uh, when you're using a diamond resin, you've got a multi-layer product. Uh, typically on sandpaper, you're almost single layer or are single layer, uh, almost like a vacuum braze tool would be, where you're, you've got a single layer of, of um, abrasive uh, mechanically bonded to a substrate to, to do your cutting, your grinding, that type of thing. So, you know, they are similar, but they're different. Okay. Cool. Well, thanks very much. Learned Thank a you. lot. Really appreciate the hospitality. You're welcome. Thank you.